Well, I'm excited to talk to you about your book, Editing for Directors. It's 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 a wonderful book, and uh, and it's it's your fourth book. Correct. Film editing book is that right? Correct. Yeah, it's great. I've also read uh, Film Editing. It's got a long title. You have to help me with it. Film Editing, uh, gr uh, great cuts every filmmaker and movie lover must must know. There it is. Yeah. This is a must read book. I love this book. This is a fantastic book. Um, was that would that be your first film book? This was actually the second. Um, but it got a great cover and it's a lot of fun. It's it's like a Pictionary yes. of edits and what yes. the editor would make them. I, I don't know if I picked the color section, but we did get some in color. And um, it just was a lot of fun. 600 fame grabs from uh, well-known movies to illustrate cuts like smash cuts, flash cuts. What are they? Why would an editor make them? All that. So that's yeah. great cuts. I just call it great I, I, cuts I, I, for short. It's a great, it's a fantastic book. People should read that. But we're not going to talk about that book today. We're going to talk about your your newest book. But before we do that, um, I wanted to just do a little bit of highlights of kind of how you become an editor and and where you where you are today in your career and things like that. Um, my first question I ask all my guests is when you were a kid, what was your favorite movie? What have you seen the most of any movie? Oh, <laughs> the, wow. I probably, you know, I came of, I grew up in the 50s, so TV was kind of the big thing then. Okay. And um, I can remember watching Wizard of Oz on TV yeah. uh, with my mother. And, um, you know, she had prepped us for the change to color and what a big deal that was for her growing up in the 30s. So yeah. um, I would... Uh, and we were in our pajamas and I had read the book and, you know, so in some ways it was a little disappointment because, um, you know, it didn't quite go the way the book did. Um, yeah. but, um, you know, uh, I think that, that was pretty memorable. That's a great film. I haven't seen it in a little while, but, but I, I've seen it a handful of times and it's a, it's a beautiful film. So. And I mean, it was amazing after seeing it on the small screen because that's what it was available for our gen and it yeah. came back on the big screen and, and to see it as an adult on the big screen which we've all now it's really ballyhooed you know much yeah. more than when we grew up and when i grew up and uh it's amazing to see in the big screen too i think yeah very very epic it's kind of like a like watching lawrence of arabia or something it's meant to be seen as big as possible big as possible i i totally agree with you so um some couple things I know about you is, um, you know, as you are thinking about working in the film industry, you kind of start out as a projectionist, right? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Now, is this a projectionist like at a theater? A, yes. A traditional theater? So you're putting all of the film on the platters and splicing it all together, and that's you. You're doing all of that. I was actually, I started at the end of the business uh -huh. um, and pre-platter. Platters came in the late 70s. Oh. And, okay. um, but I ran Star Wars on a traditional, more trad actually it was semi-automated that some of the changeovers were automated, but, yeah. um, I, this is sort of an aside to editing, but if you look at old films, you, in the right corner, every 20 minutes, you will see a star or a dot. Yeah. And, um, that told a projectionist, the reels that they ran on film were 20 minutes long or less. And yeah. so every 20 minutes you had to change over to another projector and the film overlapped so that the audience, if it was done properly, which it was 90%, 90% of the time, never yeah. noticed that you changed over to another projector. But yeah, yes. you did changeovers and you had to load the next reel. And uh, so, um, and, and I have to say, um, I was in Northern California in Santa Rosa and um I think it was probably common other places, but women weren't in the in the um, union and weren't allowed to be projectionists. So I did break yeah. that gender. Um, That's great barrier. So it took a while, yeah. but I and I was a cashier. I started out as a cashier and a driver. So, and then you join you join the uh, the IA. Of course, I got in the IA. That was yeah. When you, when you were kind of getting into that world, we were still using uh, moviolas and flatbed and Steenbecks and all of that stuff. That was Correct. that was a part of your learning process. 
Now, I'm excited that I'm talking to you and, and that's a part of your experience because I'd like to tell you that my senior student film project at that time, um, Avid had media composer available to the students and it was, you had to get on the schedule to get in there and use it because we only had one. It was very expensive. But over here under a tarp was a Steenbeck. And the guy that was running the facility, I said, what is this? Well, I knew kind of what it was. I said, I kind of want to try this. And he's like, no one's used it like in 10 years, but we'll get it up and running. And I cut my, by myself, I cut my senior film project, 12 minute short World War II movie on a Steenbeck with all the bins and all that. And everybody thought I was crazy. And it took a long time because it's a lot of work. Um, but I have that badge of honor now to say that I, I have one film cut on a traditional steam back. So I thought you'd appreciate the fact that I actually have actually done that. <laughs> well, that's great. Yeah. I mean, you know, my gen, um, spans film to digital and, and who knows what the next gens will. And I think right. the, the, the point here is you really edit with your brain, not your hands. And, yeah. and your heart with your you edit with your brain and your heart, um, but there will always be a new technology coming down the pike. And if you want to be an editor, you really need to stay current with it, and it will help you get jobs. As cool as as cool as it was to work on that steam back and to touch the film and and say, look, I, I I'm making a decision here, and I make sure I'm going to make the decision that I want, and then cut that negative or not, sorry, the work print, cut the work print and tape it together and you know all of that was was mute, beautiful and magical but boy nonlinear sure makes it a lot faster <laughs> it, it, you know i ended up training a lot of people on a system that avid eventually won the it was avid and lightworks for a while in the late um 80s and lightworks had a wonderful name avid did too but um anyway i trained hundreds of people on lightworks and some of them were coming from this uh, from linear tape, some were coming from nonlinear tape, a lot were coming from film. They didn't even go into tape because tape was more TV at the time. Um, stuff was edited on tape and shot on tape or shot on 16 and transferred to tape, um, lower budget. Um, um, and film, you know, features were on 35 millimeter. But the point of this was training people, um, training hundreds of people what I saw was it was about change and some people could really make the leap and it was every human emotion. Others were resisting it. I can't cut unless I feel the film in my hands. And I kept saying heart and brain, heart and brain, you do not edit with your hands. Um, and, um, but, um, and then other people who were older and very experienced, I saw one that just totally embraced computers and digital I mean, there were union meetings resisting this. And I mean, now it's all, I just kept saying, like it or not, it, you know, it, it's here to come. It's here. Look, yeah. It's here to stay. So, yeah. um, but, and I'm, and I'm saying a lot of this, um, uh, we're, we're hitting the te technical a little, which I do in the book. I want to ground directors, um, in what they need to know about the editing technical aspects, um, you know, color correcting and, and some of that. But um, I, I just would say to your audience, change is going to happen and we need to keep up with it. And it's not just in terms of technology, it's in terms of storytelling techniques. If you look at some older films, um, I, I looked at the original Odd Couple movie about 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and it was like slow. I was like snapping along. We, yeah. Our attention spans are shorter for better or for worse and timing and, and, um, and cinema literacy changes. I mean, the, people didn't know what a close up was in the beginning. You know, they barely existed. Right. And I, I spent a part of what I love writing about this editing for directors book was I did a whole chapter on film editing history. It could, yeah. it's, it's worth a whole book. And I did it just to show this evolvement and to show that editing did matter. And editing is kind of what separates film from other arts in a way and, and how it's evolved to, uh, to now you're putting digital heads on people 
and right. and from the early magician um, filmmakers like George Méliès in um, in France, who did um, A Trip to the Moon, which was the first major video effects movie, and pretty right. fab. It's still, you know, um, Scorsese remade it as Hugo and and went over Méliès's life and gives you an appreciation for early filmmaking. It's great. And I was going to mention that. I thought your book did a really wonderful and an important job of telling the history of editing. I think it's good to have that perspective, even as a young filmmaker who's starting now to realize where we came from and, and how we got here. I think I think it's 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 an important thing. So I'm I'm I was really great grateful that you did that in the book, that you spent some time talking about the history of the book. Um and talking about your book, Editing for Directors, um, it it's it's great and it's it's good for uh, uh, new directors so they have a, they can they can have a a, a foundation, uh, you know, a place to start from, an understanding and on the tools you give them the tools to to have a successful first experience editing a movie, but it's also a really great refresher course for those of us that are a little more seasoned, have done some features and things like that, just just to kind of, you know, sharpen sharpen your tools and just remind yourself of of where you came from and 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 the different approaches and different mindsets and things that you need to be remembering that maybe you've forgotten as you've gone through your career. So it was a really good refresher course for me. Um, it was funny. You had all kinds of little uh, things about DJ uh, uh, agreements for directors and you, you're, these are your rights. And da, da, da. I'm like, oh, I'm DGA and I totally forgot that these are my rights. You know, I kind of just go with the flow, but it was interesting. So I got a good DGA uh, rights a reminder from you on all of the things that uh, that come with, with being a DJ member and editing a movie. Um, and it also, it just, it just does a really good job of sending the message that an editor does more than just make cuts. So yeah, I think it's important because editors get this rep of left on the cutting room floor um, and, um, okay, I'm going to go into this story. One time, um, uh, my wife and I were up for insurance and, um, a few years ago in LA and when they saw I was a film editor, they wouldn't insure, they said, no, we're not going to give you the high grade of insurance because you leave people on the cutting room floor and an actor could sue you, um, for taking them out of the film. And I, very calmly explain to this person that this is not the way Hollywood works. As an editor, you are following what the producer or director tells you to do. Yeah. And you are, you, yes, you are physically doing that. You are the person that's doing that, but it's not your decision. A, and really B, an actor would never sue because they want to keep working and they wouldn't sue the editor. They would sue the the film company and they wouldn't oh, do right. it. I said, this is ridiculous. Yeah. And, yeah. but we went to another insurance company. I mean, it, 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 that's how it's insane. Crazy. And this was in LA where they could have taught easily talked to somebody other than the right. The jury. Um, yeah. so I, I just always, um, so the, the, the myths around uh, filmmaking, um, definitely involve editors and yeah. Yeah. Um, the question was about storytelling. Um, and I think that's why, um, a lot of editors want to say we are the last storytellers. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. what you were thinking of when you planned the movie, what you got when you shot it, the editing is where the buck stops and, or the footage stops. And it's, is where you have to make something, um, of whatever arrives no matter what was planned and so sometimes you get a lot of times you get great planned footage and hopefully you can respect it and make it even better or at least as good as everyone thought sometimes you get stuff that just doesn't work and hopefully yeah. it's your joy it's your job to try and make something work and um have a character work, a person work, and have a story that has major holes in it that wasn't written properly and pull something out of it. Yeah. I I also love this uh this this quote or from your book. It says editing is not for slobs. <laughs> 
I, I, I really understand what that means because I tried working on a steam back. So I definitely understand you cannot be sloppy when you're doing that. But it means more than that. It means even today in the nonlinear world, you as an editor, you can't be a slob. So just expand on that a little bit. And what kind of person makes a good editor, you know, when it comes to, 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 that, to that quote specifically, editors are not slobs. Organization, organization, organization. Yeah. Um, you want to organize stuff on the computer and the digital editing system so that you can keep your head in the editing process and just know where the close up of Ryan is going to be, know where the wide shot of his family is going to be, and, yeah. and just be able to grab it. And especially if you and I are working together and you're the director and we're recutting something. You don't want to, I don't want to keep you waiting while I go, oh, how did I label this? Labeling is the first part of it, is labeling everything properly. Yeah. And you, you don't want to keep it, I don't want to keep a director waiting while I'm going, well, where did I put this and what bin is it and how did I organize it? You want to have that in your head and be able to grab it and and just go with the flow and keep in the editing head because You've edited, and editing is incredibly immersive. You are like in the zone, you and are. nothing. You get very lost because you're just your mind is going forward and backward and looking at what's in front of you, um, and um, it's exhausting mentally, really. Um, yeah. But it's 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 um, also wonderful at the same it, time. It, extremely rewarding, especially when you just take something that you thought was ordinary and you make something extra special out of it. You know, you're like, wow, I didn't see that on the set, but look what you just did with that. You just elevated it so much. And so those little moments are, are exciting when that, when those occur, you know, um, another one I loved and you put it so beautifully, you wrote, why should I trust this person to deliver my baby? <laughs> Which is in reference to picking a good editor. And I think that's a great, because it is your baby, if you think about it. A filmmaker makes something, puts their life into it. This is their baby, and they need to find somebody to deliver it, you know, safely. And and that's that's obviously the editor. Um, so on that topic of, of, and you talk about this in the book, the importance of finding an editor you can collaborate or, and with. Um, but like just a couple bullet points here. What, you know, when someone's looking for an editor, you know, what are kind of say the top two or three things that should be at the top of the list when it comes to picking an editor? Do you think is it experience? Is it you know what what what's high on the list? Well, I think it's uh, important to have somebody that you feel you trust and can communicate with, and um, you know you you may like uh, Thelma Schoonmaker and Martin uh, Scorsese are like a marriage for years and years. They work together. She's in on the script. She's in from the beginning. But a lot of the time and more of the time, the editor is brought on af after things are shot or maybe during the shoot, depending on the budget um, and um, the timing of the project. Um so you want to, you, like you said, Ryan, you're, you're, you're meeting a stranger and, you know, obviously you're going to have an interview. You're going to, um, maybe they have a reel. You're going to look at their reel. Um, you're going to have some foreknowledge. You're going to talk to people, find out, you know, if other people, you know, the normal things that you would do. Um, but you know, you, you also want to talk about the project and get, so I think number two would be you know, how are they approaching the project? And I mean, I know an editor that got the job and they kept saying, how are you going to cut this? How are you going to cut this? And he said, I don't know until I look at the footage. And, and that's part of it. You, you know, there's what's on the page again, and there's what you're going to actually see. And, um, so, um, I think those two are, um, important. And I think usually an editor has an assistant to do a lot of the organizing, um, on lower budget projects, they'll be doing it all. I think you want to make sure you have somebody that's responsible and consistent and, um, you know, you know, is going to show up and not leave for another job or flake out. Um, yeah. but they will have the patience, um, to see it through. That's great. I, uh, you know, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of different editors. Um, the one I currently love to work with is a gentleman by the name of Harry Miller. He's one of the, if not the head editor, 
I think he is the head editor actually on La Brea, which is a new series right now on television. And he's done a bunch of other films and series as well. And he's been, it's been really great to work with him for a couple of reasons. One, um, he has good taste. Good taste, I think, is important. When you work with people with good taste, I think good taste sometimes trumps other things because you know that they're just going to make good choices because they have good taste in general, even if they don't have all the technical knowledge per se as to say someone else. Instinctively, they're just going to help make good choices. And he does have good taste. Um, he also has just, he's had a lot of experience. He's an experienced editor, has, has a lot of great ideas. And, 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 you know, he brought me the idea of, of bringing him on early in the sense of reading the script and discussing the script and how to consider shooting things and talking about transition shots between scenes and everything. So that when I go to set, I'm also thinking about what he's thinking about, what he thinks we might need, and making sure that's on my shot list and I get it so that we're not wishing we had it later, you know? So we have that collaboration process early on with the script a little bit. Let me ask you this, since you have a lot of experience, what is a common mistake that you probably see more often than not with new directors when they come in to edit um, a film? Um... Could is it a lack Probably, of certain knowledge or? Yeah, I think, I mean, you sound fantastic to work with and you really get it. And I think it's just not listening. Mm. It would be not listening and, and um, thinking, not being open to trying things. Um, and, and that goes both ways. I mean, sometimes as an editor, you go, no, that's not going to work. But, um, you know, you really should show people. And that has bitten me when I kind of said no. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. Which is rare. Mostly you really do do it. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, I, and I would say um, the first, I, the, the book really is laid out from beginning to end. So it really hits yeah. hard on, um, in the beginning on shooting for editing, because that's where you're going to end up. That's where you're going. And you may not understand the editing process at all. Um, and just, I would, uh, a new, um, a new director would really benefit by hiring a good post team that is going to say, Hey, you may not understand this, but we've got your back here. We've got your vision. We want to support you and we want to tell you the truth and help you through this. And, um, so, um, yeah, that I would say, I would also say, get coverage, get coverage, get coverage. Yeah, um, you think it's all going to play in a master and a certain shot, and, and um, you're going to you may want to cut the scene down. You may need a transition shot, so get those um, close up shots and insert shots that are going to really um, save you in the editing room. I get really scared by the oneer when the AD says, "Hey, we're going to do this in a oneer." I get really scared. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I get really scared. I'm like, oh boy, you know. Uh, even if the even if that moment's only two eighths of a page and it's not very hard and it looks great, I, it still makes me a little bit nervous just to get one one angle. I'm all I'm all about the coverage. I'm more about coverage than takes. I, I try to remind people that we don't need to have a perfect take all the way through. We're looking for the pieces, and a lot of times by the end of the movie, when I'm working with a new actor, they'll figure me out as a director and they'll say, "Did we get the pieces, Ryan? Did we get the pieces?" Mm -hmm meaning like they didn't love the whole take. And I'm like, yeah, because I'm only going to use probably this moment here and this moment here. And when you go over to the fridge, I got to be on this person because I need to see what they're doing. So don't worry about that flub there, you know? And so they eventually trust me and realize that as long as we have all the pieces, we'll have a really great product at the end. And and so I think a lot of times when, I'm, as been a, when I've been a cinematographer for first-time directors, they keep going and going and going on this take, looking for this perfect take all the way through. And it's like, well, where do you want the audience to be at that moment? And if you know you're not going to be here at that moment, then we can move on. We don't need any more of this because you're not even going to use that piece, right? So well, that's, it's a little bit of pre-visualization, pre-cutting, I guess, you know? Well, that's terrific, Ryan. I mean, you really have the vision of where it's going. And, and I think that's what you want when you're shooting um when you're a director um and i mean i looked at your reel and you, and it was um it was a lot of close-ups of people that sold what you were trying to do you were trying to help them um yeah. fund their businesses and you had beautiful close-ups of people 
Oh, thank and, you so much. I mean, it was a, a reel, but, you know, the, it, it, yeah. it really spoke to getting that coverage. I mean, I just always say, you know, Meryl Streep's face can say more than a thousand words of dialogue. Yeah, yeah. That's a and, quote in your book, too. You talk about the close-up of Meryl Streep, right? Yeah. It says more than, I, saw, I think it was a, says more than a page worth of dialogue, I think. Yeah. He said. yeah so and good. I mean, I just saw it with a male actor. I, I can't remember what show it was. Oh, it was Stanley Tucci. I was watching Inside Man. And oh, I haven't seen it yet, but I want to watch it. Oh, he, I mean, and he, and I said, I, I, I said to Sherry, there's my quote, you know, right on. I mean, he's an incredible actor. You don't need much from him. I could, you yeah. know, sometimes I mentally cut lines and going, you could have just had them, you know, they, they could have said it. But um, at any rate, um, you know, so so getting that coverage and, and also sound. Um, I have two chapters on sound. And I think, um, like you said, you need the pieces um, I also think people are more forgiving of bad visuals than they are sound. That's very true, especially at film festivals. I've had that experience where people will watch a movie and it'll look fine. Like they'll accept an out of focus shot or whatever, but if the sound's bad, they're like, I can't, I don't know what they're saying. And they just leave. They'll leave the theater. I know that you also teach. I don't know if you're currently teaching, but you've taught at a lot of different, uh, universities and things like that. Um, th this book, did it? Uh, has it ever been a, a book for one of your classes ever? Or because you teach editors, this isn't so much for them. Well, I, I, the, the last, I haven't taught in university since I retired up here to Northern California. Oh, okay. okay. But what I have done is uh, taught uh, classes at the local, local media center okay. um, where they're learning about editing and they've got somebody showing the okay. final cut yeah. pro. Um, but um, with, I don't do that kind of thing anymore. But, um, you know, I, I'll talk more about what we're talking about. You know, what does an editor do? I'll talk about sound editing. Um, I did one on the history of editing that was pulled from this book. Um, but what I'm doing now is actually um, I'm, I'm teamed up with a professor of homiletics, and um, she's also a preacher. And homiletics, I had no idea what that was. And it is the design. I, I don't know what that is. <laughs> it's the design of preaching. Okay. And um, her students love it when she gives them uh, scene lines. You know, I, I always say, you know, uh, fade in Jerusalem, you know, 1 BC interior temple. And, you know, they love it. They, they, it, she, it helps, she calls their sermon scripts when she's teaching them. And so what it's part of the series that um, uh, the Perkins Center for Preaching Excellence and, and SMU, uh, Southern Methodist University in Dallas, is doing. And it's how writing and editing techniques from filmmaking can help um, preachers um, engage their audiences better, get their uh, what they want to say across better. It's not about jazzing up their sermons with you know, media and lights. It's about yeah. um, um, having more of a dialogue and, and um, an interaction with their audience. And as she likes to say, no one's talking at, you know, after the sermon about the sermon, they're talking about what movie they saw. <laughs> and, um, you know, so it's been a very um, different journey for me. That's great. Well, that, that, that's, that, that's really interesting. That's a, that's a great, powerful thing that you're working on right now. And it sounds like it's very fulfilling, which is good. It is. So, um, I, I did want to tell you that I think one of my biggest takeaways from your book was the importance of caring about characters. Um, I've always known that, but in a weird way, after reading your book, Gail, I just realized, I think it might be the most important thing. Because as an audience member, we could be forgiving of certain things, but if we don't care about the characters, we won't remember the film, and we just won't care about the film. You think I'm crazy, Gail, or do you think I'm on the right no, path? No, I don't. I mean, I, I, I was part of a writer's group at, um, when I was in the TV Academy, which I got in as an editor, but I was working on my screenplays. And there was a woman who had written a bunch of series and she was our guru and she was Jewish. And she said, if you write well, people will care for Hitler and um, they will care that he gets it, but they will care. 
you know, you are involved in the villain's life. You want to see the villain get it, you know. So that's why they always say villains need to be worthy of your protagonist. So, um, but even minor characters, a lot of times we love the minor characters. The major characters are sort of the, you know, the pretty boy and the pretty girl or the pretty boy and the pretty boy or the pretty girl, the pretty girl, however it's going. But the, the, the sarcastic or the, the messed up minor characters is more interesting. Um, and, yeah. and what does that say? It says for how it was written and how it was acted. Mm hmm. Yeah, and of we, course edited. <laughs> yeah, of course and edit and edited. Well, it's interesting because it's kind of like when you go see a play, you know, and at the end all the people come out to to take a bow, and inevitably the person whoever is kind of the sidekick who's super funny is always the one that gets the biggest you know applause, even more than the leads a lot of the time. So yeah, supporting characters sometimes really can steal the magic and 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 can be the ones that the audience really connects to. So. Well, it's been great to talk to you. Again, this is an awesome book, Editing for Directors. I think everybody should read it. Even if you've done a lot of films, you should still read it. It's a good, it's a great refresher, you know? Um, let me ask you this question. Um, so beyond, of course, reading your awesome books, for you, like, can you recommend any anything filmmaking-wise that you love? It could be a book, a podcast, uh, a movie they should watch, a website they should go to. Is there a film resource that you just love beyond uh, beyond obviously promoting your own book, which is amazing? Um, well, Walter Murch is considered the guru of of editors um, in the blink of an eye, That's and a great book. I think he's very you know he got the Academy Award for editing, uh, picture editing, and sound. Um, starting with Apocalypse Now, he's worked on a lot of terrific films. And he's just philosophical about it and very interesting and very readable. So that's yeah. kind of a, a seminal uh, book on editing. And I would just say watch films and watch what people do. Um, I really feel like films merge our dream world, our, our um, thought world, um, and our life. I mean, sometimes I don't know well did that happen or did i see it in a movie or did i dream it i mean and that's why editing which brings together all the shots is in in short and long lengths is like is like thought it's the closest art to thinking because you know sometimes we dwell on something sometimes we think something really quickly and those are like shots and and um so um, one of the editors that I, hi that I really just, uh, take it to the next level and I appreciate is Chris Dickens. And he started with Shaun of the Dead. He did Hot okay. Fuzz. He did Les Mis. He did Rocket Man. Um, and I, he probably, I'm, he probably did, uh, Scott Pilgrim versus the world. He probably did all of Edgar Wright's films. Would you say? Probably. I'm, I don't know. I know hmm. he did Slumdog and oh, I've okay. taught and he just layers the footage and the sound and you're not even aware of it but every little scene there's just so much to it um um so i i really appreciate how he's taking thought and filmmaking ahead so those would be yeah. my things is just to watch films and um you know, read whatever books about it call to you and yeah. listen to music i mean it's all part of it the Walter Murch book and the blink of an eye that you recommended is actually a very fast read. It's not, it's very thin. It's, it's like David Mamet's on directing book. You can read it in two hours maybe. Um, but if you're going to read Gail's book, guys, it's going to take longer than two hours. <laughs> yeah. I'm sort of the nuts and the bolts. He's more than yeah. philosophical. It, I, yeah. he, he was in the A list. <laughs> so yours is your your book is a wonderful book, and I think anybody who comes out the end or, other end of reading that book will will just have more tools, um, better perspective, and and be ready to just exceed uh, and 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 benefit from your book and make a better film when they do their next movie. So thank you for writing the book. I appreciate it, and I know you put a lot of time and effort into it. Thank you for the appreciation. It means a lot. Um, 
So Gail, my last question is, is where can people follow you and see what kind of shenanigans and things you're up to, new books that are coming out and things you're posting and sharing? Where, where, where can they find you? Um, I had a website, Joy of Film Editing. I blogged for like six years. Um, I finally had to do other projects. It, blogging takes a lot of time for sure. all those who have done it, want to do it. <laughs> um, and so I don't have a, a, a website to follow me. I would just say you can Google me online. Um, and um, uh, that's, that's I guess, about what you can do. I, you, for, feel free to connect to me on Facebook. Um, I'm always um, happy to hear about what people are doing or help. That's great. Well, Gail, again, thank you for your time. It's been wonderful to hang out with you today. And, uh, and I hope to eventually get to meet you in person at some point. That would be great. And thank you.